Welcome to the She's a 10 Times 5 show with hosts Lori Jabbar and Michelle Emick. We're bringing public figures, subject matter experts, and other accomplished guests to the Studio 50 table to serve you up the best tips, tricks, and key takeaways that all us midlifers want to know about. Okay, time to join us for some Times 5 fun. Let's go. Okay, all you tenors, we're bringing in a little piece of greatness into Studio 50. She's a two-time Emmy Award winner, eight-time Gracie Award winner, nine consecutive NYT best-selling author, and the financial expert who not only carried her own hit show, but has also been a fixture alongside Oprah Winfrey, Anderson Cooper, Stephen Colbert, and Brian Williams. If you haven't guessed her yet, it's none other than Susie Orman. Susie will sit down with Michelle and Lori to discuss what us midlife life women need to know to empower and educate ourselves in order to make the best short and long-term decisions on our personal finances. Get out your notebooks for this one. Look as good as you feel with great skin made simple. Welcome to the all-in-one skincare system created by world-renowned plastic surgeon, Dr. Amir Karam. There's no need to look anywhere else. The Karam MD Trifecta packs more than 20 state-of-the-art ingredients into an easy three-step system that addresses all aspects of aging for your best skin ever. Use discount code SHE'S A10 for 10% off your purchase. Let's go. Okay, welcome, Susie. We are in the presence of greatness. I told you to say that. You didn't have to say it, but I told you to say it. But it's kind of true. Okay, no problem. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know what I love is when you meet women that uh, are groundbreaking and set the standard and become kind of the go-to for subject matter, it's really phenomenal. And also someone that's a good citizen. And so before we hit record, we were talking about all that you do for our service members. So thank you for all of that as a fellow service member. But, you know, I do want to say something about sitting in the presence of greatness and how I just kind of jokingly but not said that to you that, well, whatever. Lori, here's what's really important. Women never stand up for how great they are. And you know what I realized when I would go around the whole world speaking to women, men, whatever, and and peop- I would ask people to stand up who put on this whole event that we were at. They'd stand up and sit down, especially the women. They wouldn't stand up and own what they did. Women always say, it's fine, I'm okay, even to this day. So women, if you are great, if you know you are great, tell the world that you're great, feel that you're great and sit in your greatness, not in your, oh, it's fine type of attitude. All right, I just thought I'd say that. Ooh, we're getting off to a start, I'm loving I it. Know. Let's go. Yeah, and the other thing I think that we're becoming better is, especially as we get to our midlife, is also acknowledging other women. Because I think compliments from other women, especially if they're, you know, successful or accomplished is something else. Yeah. Actually, a compliment from anybody is something else. And the truth is, you have to be willing to accept that compliment, no matter who it's coming from. What I find more with women is that we need to learn how to wish women well. You know, I'll be honest with you. When I first started, before you really become like a Susie Orman, and I'd have in my mind what was competition, other women, financial pundits, whatever, we always, well, I didn't go after them, but they would always come after me. They would always write an article that was negative or this that was negative as if they wanted to put me down. By putting me down, it would raise them up. And and for a little bit, I started to get jealous of them for some unknown reason, even though really they were never on the same plateau as me. So one of my laws of life is may every wish that you wish another be a wish that you wish for yourself, for in fact it is. Because I had to learn really how to wish others greatness, especially women in my field, because there weren't many of us. And as soon as I realized that if you could wish them greatness, it's really a wish that you wish for yourself as well. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. Wow. I know. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. you know, being an ex-military and 
Michelle has heard me say this is if I had a do over, I wish as someone who was streaming up, you know, upstream, swimming upstream with the men that we had done a better job locking arms and supporting one another. We were really horrible with that. And that is one big regret I have. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. We all need to learn how to support one another and for one another's success. As I went on in time and I really became big, even certain people on CNBC and other, they would like, oh, did you just do that this weekend? How much did you money make that weekend? And I would answer things like more than you're going to make in your entire life. Got a problem with that? <laughs> right. But it's, um, you yeah. have to learn to be strong. You have to be a warrior and not turn your back on the battlefield. You know, my favorite motto is, especially as a woman, you know, when the dogs keep barking, the elephant keeps walking. Let everybody bark. Let everybody say whatever they want to say about you. Let them be the dogs that do that. But you have to be the elephant that keeps walking and walking to get you to where you want to go. But you have to know where is it that you want to go. Yes. Okay. So with that, let's dive into this. And Michelle, Some Michelle, yeah, Michelle and I were talking about this. When you get someone like you who is so renowned and also you got such a wealth of knowledge in kind of a really diverse subject, it could be easy to boil the ocean here. So we are going to try to be as surgical as possible. We canvassed and curated a list of questions for our genre. And Michelle, let's dive right in the first one. Yeah. Okay. We got This is the first question we got for you, Susie. Um, you've talked about before on an interview that over 90% of Americans are financially illiterate. <laughs> Oh, you Only ninety percent. Okay, okay. I, All right, go on. I said it. I bet it might be more than. <laughs> well, and especially with women, you know. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of women out there that can be both illiterate and removed from the reality of family finances. So, what do women, especially those who have a partner, that typically make the decisions and manage the finances? What What can women do to become more literate? Well. There's so many sources right now, whether it be my Women in Money podcast, truthfully, which with over 500 episodes is an entire financial literacy course to the max, not only on the emotional level, but the financial level, because really you can't you can't separate the two. You know, who you are and what you have is always one. But what's really interesting with a woman is a woman normally takes care of the household finances. And why is that? Because the house holds everything that she loves. It holds her children, her pets, her plants, possibly her parents, her spouse. So that she's totally literate in. And it's usually her financial spouse or her spouse that does the investing. But she is absolutely capable. You know, women, it's our nature to nurture. It, you know, we were born in many cases that we could give birth. And we had the ability in many cases to feed that which we've given birth to. So we've our nature has always been to nurture. What we haven't nurtured is the understanding that the day comes when women, actuarially speaking, live longer than men do. I personally think we're killing them off, but that's besides the point. But that, and when that time comes, that is not the time for all of you who are doing that to find out that when your spouse, maybe it's a male spouse, says to you, oh, honey, don't worry your pretty little head about it. I have this under control. That is not the time to find out when he passes before you that he didn't know anything about what he was doing. I'm going to tell all of you women this right now. Men are financial fakers. They do not know what they're really doing. They take their advice from somebody else. They say they understand it and chances are they don't. So bottom line is this. You are never going to be powerful in life, ladies, until you are powerful over how you think, feel, and act with your money. Not just the money in the household and paying the bills that way, but all of your money, because most of you are also working right now. Do you have the right retirement account? Do you have a Roth retirement account? It's only really retirement accounts you should have, whether it's a Roth 401k, TSP, or 403b, or Roth IRA. 
Forget these pre-tax retirement accounts. If that's what you're doing, the traditional ones, my opinion, you're making one of the biggest mistakes out there. Do you have a will, a living revocable trust, an advanced directive and durable power of attorney for health care to take care of yourself when you become incapacitated and your minor children in case something happens to you because minor children can't inherit money, people. How do you own title to your home? What are you doing to finance your kid's college education? Are you in credit card debt? Are you not? All of these things are things that you can do. You know, there's a saying in Asia that women hold up half the sky. In the United States of America, everybody, we hold up the entire sky. And it is now time for you to own the power to control your destiny. And if you are not, I am here to tell you, you are, without a shadow of a doubt, making the biggest mistake out there, period. I am so glad you said that. And I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm one of those women. And I have just over the past couple years started to lean in a little heavier because I happened to marry a man that was a CFO and who likes to control the numbers, who likes to think that he knows everything that's going on. And I think it's very easy for us to get lazy, especially if you have someone who you feel is very business savvy. Yeah. Let me ask you, do you have a living revocable trust and everything in place? Yes. You do. So that is something that he did. And have you looked at it? Do you know where everything goes? Do you know who your successor trustee is? Do you know all those things about it? We do. We just redid our trust. We have two adult children. So uh, uh -huh. uh, we, had to get, we had to get power of attorneys mm -hmm. and directives and all of that as well. So it gave us a chance to kind of relook at stuff. But so let me ask you this question. If you were to die before he, would he know how to pay all the bills and take care of all the household expenses? Yes. All right. So he's somebody who has owned the power to control his destiny. You have this podcast that you are talking to all of these people, yet really not necessarily secretly because you're announcing it here. You have to feel powerless and insecure. Yeah, to some degree. I think, you know, there was a wake up call that happened, you know, where I said, God, I'm really not involved in the investment side. And that's one of the things that I talk with other 10 times fives and sometimes 10 times four if they're, you know, eager to learn. But we start to get to the point where you look at your portfolio and you want to be risk adverse you want to have the right types of instruments and you want to have things that generate income. Sort yes. Of, because you, you are looking to retire, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Or at least putting yourself in the position that if the markets were to crash, if all of a sudden we have another war or whatever it is, even here on our homeland, which is totally possible, everybody. It could be a civil war. You never know these days what can go on that what you have and what you see is what you get to keep, that outside circumstances aren't going to affect your financial situation. And because you all have to understand that the goal of money is for you to be what? Secure. So what is it going to take for you to be secure? And women need a different level of security for some reason than men do. Like I have always said, we should all own our homes outright if we have a mortgage on a home that we're going to keep forever. We should all own it outright by the time we retire. Yet men will normally say, I don't want to own the house outright. I have a low interest rate mortgage. I'm getting a tax write off. I can make so much more money on that money. It's not even funny. Why would I want to put it in a house with no mortgage? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, how stupid can you possibly be? Number one, as you get to the end of a mortgage, there is no more tax write-off. It's all in the beginning years of the mortgage. And it's about what does it take for you to make those mortgage payments and how much does that cost you and all of these things. But the real thing is, Lori, if it would make you feel more secure, mm -hmm. then that is the decision that has to be made regardless of what he thinks he can do with the money or not. It's just that simple. I don't know really one, one wealthy person that has a mortgage on their home. 
not one, especially since you can only write off the interest on $750,000 currently. It's like, and with the price of these mortgages and homes, are you kidding me? Really, everybody? I don't think so. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question. And I'm one of these people, and you mentioned, God, what if there's something catastrophic like a war or civil war? I feel like a lot of us have become dubious of governmental in, <laughs> like instruments. You know, how are they going to hold up? How is the currency going to hold up? Um, are yeah. bonds really going to be the way to go? Because I know you want a mix of bonds and and stock. What's your thoughts there with kind of the ineptitude of our Capitol Hill people? Yeah, um, I'll admit that Treasury bills, bonds and notes at times have made me nervous. Might so much so that Sheila Bear, who was the chairman a few years ago of the FD of the FDIC, and what what happened with that is that in 2008, when the really we came closer to collapsing than you have any idea, but I did a campaign with her, a 36 million dollar campaign, public service announcement, as to why you should feel secure with the FDIC and this whole thing on TV, everything, just to stop a run on the banks. So just a while ago, when I didn't know if we were going to have a government shutdown or not, I had her on one of my podcasts, and I'm sure you can go back to that and hear, hear it. And what was funny is she was saying how we're fine and everything. And I said, well, how about you know, FDIC, right? All of these things, you know, the, not the FDIC, but the, the things that secure banks and CDs and things like that, right? And everything is kind of insured by that. So the treasury, which is insured by the treasury, the banks and everything are insured by FDIC, credit unions are insured by NCUAA, and but they're insured by FDIC. I mean, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. So I would do a combination of things. You know, bonds can be many things. They can be municipal bonds, treasury bill bonds or notes. They can be corporate bonds. You can have stocks that pay dividends. All of those things can be a mix to create your fixed income vehicles that give you income. But I'll be honest with you, at times I get nervous because of how much debt the government has as to if there really was a collapse, how would they cover all of that? But at this point, that's where we are. So mm -hmm. you have to have a mix of almost everything if you ask me. What's your thought of crypt on crypto? I think, you know, crypto is an interesting thing. I think it's gaining far more validity finally now that exchange traded funds are being created around the true value of crypto. But I will still say that I would not be investing in the crypto market with any money except the money that I could afford to lose. Yeah. Otherwise, I would not be touching it with a 10 foot pole because Anything could happen at any time. The government all of a sudden could intervene with it, can then therefore make it so it does go down once the government's involved. So I just don't think if you're going to want to make money, then make money little by little. You know, understand the value of compounding. Understand that you never take a lump sum of money and put it into the market all at once. You know, you dollar cost average with it, where if you like something, then you buy a little bit of it now, then you buy a little bit again. Like even with my treasuries, and honestly, I have millions and millions and millions of dollars in treasuries. Um, you know, I just put a little bit more in a 30-year treasury bond, um, but I didn't put a lot. Like I put, you know, some money in it to see what's happening before I put more in. So I never go all in at once on anything. Yeah, my I have absolutely zero in the physical crypto right now. I have some in stocks, not a lot, maybe $30,000 in a stock that has to do with crypto, symbol M-A-R-A, but it's, um, it's, you know, it's, I have nothing in crypto at this moment, truthfully, the actual crypto. 
my I'm a serial entrepreneur and I would always tell people never put your money into something you don't know anything about. You got that. That is my hard line with crypto because and I feel like the true definition of a blonde when I try to understand what's going on with that hairball. It is way, way above my pay grade. I, I, like, I don't get it. What color hair do I have? Well, it depends. I need a I need to get color right got now. Three blondes here. <laughs> we got yeah, so, like three blondes. So, yeah, so we won't be digging blonde hair because I don't understand crypto. Yeah. I don't really understand what secures it. I don't, I can't really wrap my head around it. So it's like, nah, I don't think so. Not for me. However, there is, there are people that speculate. There are people like Kathy Woods, who I think is brilliant with her investments that now has a you know ETF that way. So if people want to take money again that they can afford to lose just because they feel like they want to be involved with it, be my guest. That's great advice if you've got the money. To yeah. lose. Yeah. To lose. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I have a whole lot of money and I don't like losing any of it. So Me that's either. besides the point, yeah. Yeah, no fuck you money over here. Okay, I mean, um, here's something for you. And this is a conversation that... Uh, happens a lot with us women who our kids go off to college. Michelle is not there yet, but that want to downsize. And they've got these properties that have risen in value and there's a significant uh, cash consequence. I was asked by probably eight ladies, what's the right way to go about avoiding that tax consequence? And they asked me to ask you about 1031. Mm. So there's a big difference between an investment property, a commercial property, a rental property, and a primary residency. So when you have a primary residency that you have lived in your home as a primary residency for two out of the past five years, then when you go to sell it, you get a $250,000 exemption and if you own it with somebody else, they also get it. Let's say your spouse, they also get a $250,000 exemption. So that's $500,000 that you do not have to pay capital gains tax on. Number one, you buy a house, let's just say, for a half a million dollars. And now it's worth a million dollars and you go to sell it and you've lived in it for two out of the past five years as your primary residency no tax whatsoever on it. Remember your cost basis also is the amount of money that you put into it for repair. So you buy a $500,000 house, you put $200,000 into it for renovation or whatever. Now your cost basis is $700,000. So don't forget that everybody. Also, I think it's very important that if you happen to live in a community property state, look it up to see if you do or you don't, California, Texas, Washington, so forth, and you own your property in community property with right of survivorship, if your spouse, with a spouse, if your spouse happens to die, you get a step up in basis on the entire property. So you buy it for $30,000, $500,000, whatever it is. It's now worth $3 million and your spouse dies, your new cost basis on it is $3 million. If you turn around and sell it at that point in time, no capital gains, or it will be taxed on the $3 million mark. Remember, if you own it in joint tenancy with right of survivorship, and a spouse dies, you only get a step up in basis on half of it, not on the entire amount. So those are things for you to think about. So with a primary residency, I, I, you don't do a 1031 exchange with it. You have a rental property, and now you wanna do a 1031 exchange, which what is what it's technically called. They can be very, very tricky. First of all, my recommendation would be you have an intermediary, somebody that the money goes through to make sure that you do everything according to the IRS. 
So what a 1031 exchange is, for those of you who may not know, is let's say you have a rental property and maybe you paid 300,000 for it and now it's worth a million and you don't wanna pay any taxes on that. You have 45 days from the day that you have sold it to find a property that is just like essentially the one that you sold. You have 180 days from the day that you sold it to close on that property. So then what happens is your cost basis of the first one now has transferred to the cost basis of the second one and you haven't had to pay any capital gains tax on it. Now, I just have to say this and I hope I'm not going, getting over a lot of your heads. You have to think about this because unless you're going to leave that property to your beneficiaries, your children, where upon your death, they get a step up in basis. So then you've avoided taxes on it altogether. But if you intend to possibly sell that property while you are still alive, just be very careful because with the debt that we're carrying, who knows what income tax brackets are going to be 10 years from now? Who knows what they're going to do to the capital gains tax 10 years from now? So just be very, very careful with that. But that is how you would technically do a 1031 exchange to make sure that you don't get in any trouble. That's really good info. It is really complex. I mean, it's there's a lot of layers to that. And there, it, there's a lot of layers to owning property in general and, and depending on what state you're in, right? Yeah, of course, right? So, but... Um, you know, it just depends. I always say, oh, just, you know, pay the capital gains tax. Now, here's something you might want to think about. If you ever are in a situation where you don't have any income for a year, let's say you're a woman by yourself, you've been left this property and now you're going, oh my God, I really don't want to sell it because I'm going to owe, owe all these capital gains tax on it. Capital gains, by the way, everybody, is when you've owned something for more than one year. Otherwise, if you sell it, it's taxed to you as ordinary income. Most people don't know that if you're making only, let's just say, $44,000 a year or less of income and you sell something, regardless of how much money you made on it, you don't pay any capital gains tax at all. Wow. Yeah, so I had friends who, when the Oprah Winfrey show closed down, they had a million dollars sometimes in Apple stock or whatever, but they didn't have any income for a while. Guess what? We sold everything. They didn't pay a penny of capital gains on it. And then we reinvested at the higher price. Brilliant, if I have to say so myself. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, that is good information. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we've touched upon repeatedly is we don't know what's going to be 10 years from now. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get really frustrated with women who, and men as well, who think that social security is an entitlement mm. and that they're going to be able to retire. Well, we, you know, we've put away to social security. Like that's their retirement plan is going to be receiving those resources. What's your thoughts and what would you say to those type of people? I feel sorry for you if that's how you think and you continue to think after you hear what we're about to say to you right now. Social security is absolutely in danger. Not that I think it's going to go away, but what I do think is going to happen is in the same way the full social security age years ago used to be 65 and then the full retirement age was moved up to 67 and I have no doubt that it's going to be moved up to 70. Could be moved up one day to 73. They will keep postponing, in my opinion, I don't have any inside information on this, the actual age that you have to be to collect full retirement benefits, your full Social Security, number one. Number two, if you take it before that time, let's say you take it at 62 rather than 67 right now, that's a 30% reduction to you. And not only that, 
But it's like, that's just, it, it. depending on how much money you may be making besides that, don't be surprised if they don't make Social Security fully taxable as well. At what tax bracket? Well, that's up to them. So if you're putting yourself in a situation where you think in a society where inflation may, they say it may be coming down, but has your rent come down, right? Has the price of real estate really come down? Now, some things have come down, but most of the things are really still very expensive. Let's play Social Security right now. Look at what your Social Security is going to be at whatever age you think you're going to collect Social Security. You can find that out very easily by going on to ssa.gov, register for my Social Security, and they'll tell you what you'll get. Now pretend that's all the money that you have. Just pretend that's what you have coming in. Look at your expenses as to what you think will no longer be there. Maybe you'll own your home outright. But have you looked at what's happening with insurance, property insurance, car insurance? So if you want to insure those things, you're going to see this year property, tax, property insurance went up 19%. In many cases, it's not the mortgage that people can't afford. It's the insurance on the property. Just to insure the little condo that we have in Florida that isn't very expensive, it's $28,000 a year. A few years ago, it was like $5,000 a year to insure. So are you positive that your Social Security will be able to pay for everything, look at your Medicare premiums, right? Your Medicare B premiums come out of your Social Security. So you don't get what you think you get for Social Security because you really need to get Medicare, which is my favorite thing to do versus any other form that's offered to you as you get older. Subtract a good 100 to $400 a month from that and just play social security. Can you survive on that? You cannot. So everybody, please, this is the time that you have to be financially independent. You have to fully fund at least a Roth IRA, or if you are working and they have a Roth retirement account where they match your contribution, fully fund it up to that point of the match, even if you haven't, you know, even if you don't have a pot to pee in right now, yeah, you that's have to do yeah. things like that. Are you kidding? You have to. Yeah, because so many yeah. people, right? That, I mean, I think it's like 60%, over 60% of our country lives paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, I know. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons I co-founded SecureSave.com. All of you might want to go and look it up. I don't want to talk about it here. But look at what I created to make sure that that doesn't happen. But the real thing that you need to understand is that if you can't afford to save for retirement today because you don't have enough money to pay your bills while you have a paycheck coming in, how are you going to pay for those exact same bills when you no longer have a paycheck coming in? So you need to do it today because compounding is the key. You know, my last book that I wrote was The Ultimate Retirement Guide for 50 Plus. And I went for, you know, everybody cares about if you're 20, you're 30, you're 40. Once you're in your 50s, all of a sudden nobody cares about you anymore because why? You don't count towards rating on television for advertisers. They don't care about you. I care about you. These ladies care about you. But the question is, do you care about yourself? So there are things that you still can do today to protect your tomorrows. And if you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off, please, I'm telling you, I deal with women who have put it off. And I always say to them, you know, it's, it's never too late. You know, it's never too early to begin. And I used to say it was never too late to start, but there does come a time in your life when it will be too late. It just will be. You can't start when you're 80 years of age. So $100 is better than nothing. You know, one thing, if you have absolutely no money whatsoever, 
and I do not get paid to say this. I also created with Alliant Credit Union that was just voted the best credit union for 2024, that if you simply open the Ultimate Opportunity Savings Account, you put in just $100 a month for 12 consecutive months, you'll earn 3% on it. That's not the big deal. But after 12 months, they will give you $100. But what it does, that's like a 16% return on your money, everybody. You can't put $1,200 in all at once and get it. Uh-uh. has to be $100 a month. If you can't continue it, you can still take your money out anytime. No penalties. It doesn't cost you anything. But when you start doing that, you get in the habit of saving. And now you have changed psych your psychological behavior that you say you can't, you don't have the money. And then all of a sudden you do, you see it grow. You like to see how much you have in there. And then you just keep going. Why don't you give that a try? Go to my Alliant, A-L-L-I-A-N-T dot com. Look for me and open it up. It doesn't cost you anything to open it up. They'll show you how to do it. Just go there and give it a try. Yeah. That's you, awesome. it, it, that, it is awesome. And paradigm is really, really different for younger generations. And I kind of want to dive into that. We didn't have credit cards back in the day. It was checkbook. You balance your checkbook. So if you didn't have the money, you typically didn't spend it and you did try to save what you could. We're now in a culture of, and I'm seeing it with my adult kids. It's they've got their apps. They've got their credit card. They do Uber. They have no concept except instant gratification. And I had a conversation with my older boy. He's graduated. He, he was at TCU and we did a 529 for both of our boys, which is pre-tax saving for college, if people don't know what that is. And he had a scholarship, so he had extra. And so I, I said to him, I go, you, you should roll this into a Roth. Which How much you, did he have in there? He had more than the 35K. So I, you're, you're only allowed to do $35,000, but he had more from a scholarship. So we, we're putting that into a Roth IRA, but boy, explain- But you could only, just so you know how it actually works- he can only put in the maximum, which is this year, is seven thousand dollars. He cannot take all thirty-five thousand and put it in at once. Just so you know. Correct. Correct. All right. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. But for him, it's like you know, explaining how wow, over time, this money, if you do it right, will work for you. And when it's time to use it, you would be very surprised as to how it is added up and how meaningful yeah. it can be. So for Moms like me and Michelle's got a teenage daughter. What's your recommendation for how to change the mindset and the lifestyle of kids? Because and, and get them financially independent and thinking about their own finances versus relying on us. Yeah. So teach them about compounding. Mm -hmm. I have an example of compounding and I'm going to use an investment rate that is just for an example, for an illustration to make a point. It's not something that I think is going to happen, but it's come close. You start putting $100 a month every single month into a Roth IRA at the age of, let's just say, 25. And you can adjust this all the way down to wherever, but let's just say 25. And you do that every single month till you are 65 with a 12% annual average rate of return. Now, over 40 years, the Standard & Poor's 500 index has averaged 10%. But I like using 12% for to make an example out of this. So after, 12, after getting a 12% annual average rate of return, which means one year it's up 30%, the next year it's down 40. But over those 40 years, that's what it has averaged. You would have $1 million dollars in your Roth IRA tax-free. You think to yourself, I'm still young, I'm 25. What difference can $100 a month make, which is $1,200 a year? 10 years, that's $12,000. What difference can $12,000 make? Mom, I'll start when I'm 35 and I'm just gonna have fun while I'm young. If you start at 35 rather than 
25, you would have only $300,000. Those 10 years cost you $700,000. Oh. If you bring that down by 10 years and you start at 15 rather than 25, the numbers are astronomical. When they start seeing the power of compounding that $100 a month can make, all of a sudden a light bulb goes off and they go, wait, wait, those 10 years just cost me $700,000 at $100 a month. And they start to get it. So when you start treating them like adults and show them what the future value is, go in their room and take out something that they had to buy. They just had to get and say, all right, because I did this with Katie's nieces and nephews when we they were younger. They were into these Power Rangers that were $25 each. So, of course, Aunt Susie goes over, and I notice they're not playing with them anymore. So I bring out the four Power Rangers, and I put $100 on the table. And I say, okay, let's choose. Would you rather have the Power Rangers or the $100? And they go, of course, the $100. And I go, that's what I thought. However, you got the Power Rangers. So I put it back in my pocket at that point. Next time we go to the store or something, I go, I just want you to remember the example of the Power Rangers. What do you want? You want that, that you want me to get you, or you want the cash. And they always started to say the cash. So they get it, but you have to learn how to teach it to them with real life examples. Amen. Wow. Yeah, that's great. How come Michelle doesn't ask me anything? Well, I'm just taking it all in. I, I kind of hijacked this. I'm sorry, Michelle. <laughs> no, I just... most certainly did girlfriend. Uh, I'm like, wait a minute. We have another incredible woman there. Girlfriend, what do you need to know? No, I was just thinking about the fact we started, you know, we started investing for, my daughter, she's just turned, she just turned 12. And I've been having those conversations with her. Like I told her, I'm like, you know what? We already have like $15,000 in there. And she was, she was excited to know that. And so I'm trying to start those conversations early. Um, so it's good to hear about compounding because I'm going to, I love the example. But I mean, here's the thing, Michelle, has she ever asked you for money to buy something and you've said no? Yes. No. <laughs> she has to feel ownership over that money. And this is the time she needs to make a mistake with it. So she wants to take out $300 for something stupid. Let her take out $300 for something stupid. And then six months from now, when she's no longer doing it, then go back to her and say, well, you happy you did that? That just cost you $300. Let me show you what that $300 left in there. Get yourself a compounding app. What that $300 would have been worth two years or four years or five years from now. Because what they have to understand is that this doesn't cost them just $300. This costs them what that $300 could have been later on in life. And all of a sudden they start, they start, the little thing will go on. It will go on. How did they get that $15,000 in that account? Do you have any um, recommendation? Well, of course you do. Do you have any recommendations on certain apps that would be beneficial to use? No, right. Be, I, actually, I don't. Because part of me wants them off of these computers and seeing things. Part of me wants them to be touching money. You know, sometimes I'll see a kid with, a, you know, being carried by their dad or mom in an ATM machine, getting money out. And I'd say to the kid, where do you think money comes from? And they point to the machine. <laughs> it comes from here. Right. And that's what they think. They don't under they're out of touch with money. They don't see mommy and daddy touching or mommy and mommy or daddy and daddy touching money anymore. True. All they see is plastic. Yep. So what I've had my relatives do while they were raising Travis and Sophia in particular, and I'll just tell you this very qu quick story. So Sophia swallowed a penny when she was maybe five years old. 
So of course she said, you better call Aunt Susie, right? She'll know what to do. And I'm like, oh, right. Do you take her to the doctor or not? And so I go, no, it will come out. It's all right. She's not choking. Obviously she's okay. If it doesn't come out a little bit from now, we'll, you'll take her to the doctors. But, you know, I said, but Sophia, how do you feel about that? She said, oh, Aunt Susie, it's just a penny. I made her mother, Barbara, go to the bank and get thousands of pennies. And every time they went to the store, they had to pay the grocery store. They had to pay the bill in pennies. Now, true, everybody behind Barbara was totally aggravated, but I didn't care. And finally, Sophia has her mother call me and she gets on the phone. She goes, okay, I get it, Aunt Susie. Every penny counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I, I got a funny story. You'll appreciate this because it's it's military. When I was a commander over in Germany, we had a young buck that was uh, assigned to our unit. He was 17 out of Oklahoma. And the first sergeant came in. He goes, you know, ma'am, we've got a situation. And I forget the private's name, but he said he has $50,000 in bad checks. Okay. So I bring him into my office and I was like, well, what are you thinking? And he said, ma'am, I had the checks. That's right. So they had no concept that there's something behind that piece of paper, right? Yeah, at all. Yeah. People would call up the Susie Orman show when it was on CNBC and they'd have debt and they would say, I am so mad at them. Why? I signed up for a credit card on the college campus. Mm -hmm. I had $400 of credit and now they want their money back. Why is that, Susie? Yeah, that so, was the first. I'll never forget going going to college, and they're in the you're in the union. You walk in, and you see that. You're like, whoa, yeah. what's this? <laughs> Not anymore. They aren't right because on the Oprah Winfrey show, when I was doing it all the time, I went on there and I would say, credit card dealers are worse than drug dealers. They have the ability, and this, I, this is the exact quote I would use. They have the ability to assault your children on college campuses to get them in financial debt to ruin their lives and the colleges are allowing them to do that. And eventually rules came about that they can't do that anymore. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Are um, there any last, I am, by the way, I so appreciate all of it. I feel like I've gotten my own personal fix here. So thank you. For that. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you would like to leave the audience that we did not cover? Yeah, I want to go into briefly Roth IRAs, okay. Roth 401ks, TSPs, and so forth. Remember, when you save for retirement, so many of you get suckered in to the jubilation of, oh, I'm not going to have to pay taxes on this money. I get a tax write-off for it. So therefore, you normally do a traditional, which is pre-tax, traditional 401k, 403b, TSP, if your employer sponsored plan. And if you do it as an individual, it's a traditional IRA. IRA stands for individual retirement account. While it is true you get a tax write off, there are all these rules and regulations that go along with it. You can't touch it before 59 and a half. If you do, there's a 10% penalty and so on and so forth. Afterwards, when you do go to take it out, it's taxed to you as ordinary income at whatever tax bracket is in effect at that time. You die and it goes down to your beneficiaries. Now there's all these new rules as to how they have to take it out, but they're gonna have to pay ordinary income tax on it as well. When you turn 73, and again, in a few years, it will be 75 because I'm 73 this year. So for the first time ever, I'm going to have to take out required minimum distributions from the little money that I had in a pension plan until I realize what the hell am I doing? That makes no sense. And I'm going to have to pay ordinary income taxes on it. You all assume that you're going to be in a lower income tax bracket. And the ticket that everybody's trying to sell you is get the tax right off today so that when you do take the money out later on and you're in retirement, you'll be in a lower income tax bracket. How do you know what income tax bracket you're going to be in? You don't. 
And again, if you die and you leave it to your beneficiaries and your kids are still working, they're going to be in a high income tax bracket. So don't think that this postponement of when you can take out money from a retirement account, a traditional one, is just so you can keep it in there longer. No, it's so the longer that you have to, you can leave it in there, the more of a chance you're going to die with it in there. And then it goes to your kids who are in a higher income tax bracket. Do you get what's going on here? If you gave up the write off today and you did a Roth 401k TSP or 403b, as well as, and you can, besides those, also do a Roth IRA, now you're funding it with after tax money, which means, especially for a Roth IRA, any money you originally put in. You can take out any time you want, regardless of age or how long it's been in there without taxes or penalties. So you could even use that as an emergency account. There are no required minimum distributions on a Roth retirement account. When you die and it goes to your beneficiaries, also they get to take it out without any taxes whatsoever. And please remember that when you take money out of a Roth IRA or 401k, it does not count against Social Security income or your Medicare B premiums. And I could go on and on with that. So if you're out there and you currently have a 401k or 403b for nonprofit or TSP for federal government or military, fine, you can leave the, the contributions that you put in already. All new contributions should go to our Roth. Same thing with a Roth IRA over here. Now, there's so much more I could tell you about how to do it and why, but that's why we have the Women and Money podcast, truthfully. If you're not listening to it, there are over 500 episodes. You have to be kidding me. That especially, and it's geared towards those of you who are 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. So I ask you, since that's exactly what that podcast is about, it doesn't cost you anything. There are no commercials in between selling you something. It's for you and you alone, because Susie Orman isn't here to sell you something. Susie Orman is to teach you how to make more out of less money. And if you can't feel that in the passion of my voice, if you can't feel that every word I'm speaking is spoken as a truth, I don't know. And you don't know that you are sitting in the presence of greatness. Wow. We love you. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I, I'm I'm catching the next flight out to Florida, so then I can see Michelle and Susie. Yeah. Why don't you wait, catch one of the next flights out to Florida when you happen to be there? But when we're on the island, because remember, I live on a private island in the Bahamas, and KT and I will then fly you from Florida to our island for lunch and fly you back all on us girlfriends. Woo! Ooh. You do not have to twist my arm. You definitely do not have to twist Lori's arm. Right. Right? You yeah. know KT's number. Take advantage of it. I there. know. Uh, I know. All right. Susie, this is awesome. We have uh, just a few fun questions for you. You got Lori, it. You want to yeah. tee it up what we're doing? Yeah. So we basically this season are asking the five same questions to each of our guests to give a little bit of an insight into the individual that they normally would not get. So they're fun, right. physical things. OK, where is your happy place? I think I know what you're going to say, but lay it on us. My happy place is actually on the boat that we have fishing for Wahoo. So as happy as I am in the Bahamas, nothing makes me happier. And I'm the captain of my own boat right? And KT is the first mate, is being on that boat, fishing, winning fishing tournaments, the whole thing, and showing everybody that in the age of your late 60s, you can learn a new craft and not only learn it, conquer it, and win tournaments doing it yourselves. Wow. <laughs> Just what? No, we're like, what? Let's go. Okay. All right. You you take a flight. You can sit next to anybody, living or deceased. Who would you want to sit next to? KT, period. Oh. KT, 
right? Um, because I'm not really interested in meeting those who you would know and those who have made it and everything like that. The people in life that have most impressed me is who have gone from nothing, living in their car, being in a financial abusive relationship, being really ill, whatever it may be. And really by listening and reading my books and the Money and Podcast and the Susie Orman Show, where I get their email saying, Susie, I know you're not gonna believe this, but remember I wrote you 30 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever it may be. And I was on the streets and now I own my own home and I'm actually a millionaire. Now that's somebody I would like to meet. That's somebody I would like to sit on the plane with. That's somebody who I stand in awe of. So I stand in awe of those who everybody else thought they never ever could or would, but they actually did. Wow. And so from somebody who has pretty much met just about everybody. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of a weird question, but, you know, curious minds. Do you believe in aliens? Um, I do. <laughs> Good. And But let me tell you why I believe in aliens. Way back when, not so far ago, and, you know, we were at all kinds of places where they shoot up all those places. But a long time ago, I was at the home of one of the head NASA scientists. And he had all these pictures there of Jupiter and everything. And I said to him, are there aliens out there? And he said, absolutely. We hear them all the time. We have all these machines that listen to them. We know that they're there and they're there. And there was no reason that I had to doubt him at all. So I believe it. Why not? Listen, if we're here, mm -hmm. you got to think about it, ladies. We're in our own way, really aliens. Like there's some of us that are really aliens, but that's besides the point, right? Um, why wouldn't there be aliens other places? Absolutely. And I have to say this, I actually was in San Blas, Mexico, living in my car. This is when I was a waitress. Remember, I was a waitress until I was 30, everybody. And my girlfriend and I at the time got into my Ford, actually, we got into our Volvo. I had a 1967 Volvo station wagon. And this was like in the late not 79, eight, right in there, in the late 70s. And we drove to San Blas, Mexico, and we lived in this car in a little camping site. And at night, we would just walk around. We stayed there for almost a month. And there were this group of people all standing there and like, what are they doing? And they were all looking up and there was like this orange sun, like almost like you could touch it right in front of us. And we watched it just glimmering there for about 20 minutes and then it just zoomed away. And then we said, does this happen often? And the people, right, we, had, we needed a translator because they were all speaking in Spanish, right? They said, oh, it comes all the time. So I saw it with my own eyes. Very cool. Okay, uh, we got two more questions. Favorite concert you've ever attended? Um, there's so many from Taylor Swift to Adele, but really was on February 15th of last year was the Jimmy Buffett concert mm. that was held at the Hard Rock um, in Fort Lauderdale here. And we were really, really close friends with Jimmy. He lived very close to us on this island, spent so many days with us, having dinner, talking about his illness, everything. And when I met Jimmy, he came for dinner and he brought one of his CDs that he signed and he thought I'd be so impressed. And I said, Jimmy, I love you because he was a master fisherman and that's why we loved him. And I said, but I have to tell you, I really don't like your music. I've actually never listened to it. He said, no problem. And I think it actually relieved him because then he kind of knew that I wasn't just another fan who wanted to get to know him. And, but as we knew that he was getting more and more ill, um, he, we, he said, you know, I'm doing maybe one of my last concerts in Fort Lauderdale, will you come? So we came and we, it was the most incredible concert I've ever seen in my life. Not just because of how great he was, but because of his fans, the parrot heads. I mean, I've never seen such devotion like that. And so for me, that was the greatest concert I've ever been to. 
Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I saw him in um, the Bay Area, and he was phenomenal. Phenomenal. Just, yeah. Right. But wait, I have to say this phenomenal without all of the things behind him, the screens and yeah, the yeah. flying in the air and the this and the that, just by being on stage. Oh, my God. Fabulous. Anyway, last. Okay. Last question. Yeah, this one has a little bit more gravitas to it. If you could tell your former self, that little girl, something that you know today, what would it be? Nothing. No? I wouldn't tell myself anything. And let me tell you why. It's, you know, I didn't grow up in the greatest of circumstances. I didn't great go, grow up with the greatest relationship with my father. I didn't grow up thinking that I would ever be anything more than a waitress. And that's not putting down waitressing because I think waitressing was one of the greatest jobs I've ever had in my life. But everything that happened to me without knowing what was going to happen to me made me who I am to this day. So I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't change anything that's ever happened to me on any level, whether it was a serious illness I had or operation or things that happened to me with my father or whatever it may be. I wouldn't change a thing and I wouldn't want to know what was going to happen because I would just want to know whatever I knew growing up. And I don't even know what that was, but whatever it was, it got me to where I am to this day. Wow. Okay, Susie, this was amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Probably my, if not my favorite, you know, I can't really say that, but this interview was just phenomenal. Right. And Michelle, if you ever just want to talk to me, girlfriend, and yeah. ask me what it is that has kept you in silence, I'm right here for you. Like I said, you know, KT's you know, telephone number, use it. And I'll oh, talk yeah. to you and answer anything you ever want to know. Thank you. And I do live, I mean, I'm in Tampa, so we're not that far away. Well, you have no excuse for not coming no to our island. But if Lori and I come, I mean, she's just going to dominate the conversation. I'm going to have no, no time. So we'll just I go. won't let her. No. I won't let her. I don't right? normally do that though, Michelle, do I? Doesn't normally do that, but I think this, she had, she was coming in with a lot of, a lot of questions. So that's okay. It's all right, Lori. I love you. I think it's because I'm in that space of life where these are meaningful topics for me and we're all trying to figure it out. I also have a husband that's, you know, almost 20 years older than me. Yeah. So, so you really have to know these yeah. things. And I think, I think that the reality is hitting and my kids are off and it's okay. Let's get this thing dialed in. So, so I'm always here for you and everybody, you know, shortly I'm going to be setting up something on fireside where I'm going to be able to communicate with people like awesome. this rather than just my podcast where I can't really do that unless they write in and da, 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 da. And so I'm excited to set that up. So I'll be able to do things just like this with hopefully, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. You do know, by the way, from Tampa that your mayor is quite the fisherwoman. Do you know that? I did not know that. Uh-huh. She's fabulous, by the way. Do you way. fish with her? Do you fish with her? I haven't, but she arranged for me once. I was getting some award in Tampa from some organization there, and she arranged for a little boat for me and KT to go out on to do snook fishing, but she's fabulous and sends emails every once in a while to me. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I love that you're, I love that you got into fishing and you're competitive about it. Oh, so much so. It drives the men crazy. Uh, seriously, men who have spent 30 years of their life to learn how to catch wahoos and win these contests and everything. And here's two older women in a little boat going out <laughs> and cleaning their clock clean, yeah. wiping it clean. I right? yes. love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. But yeah. We wish them well. We oh, wish really? them well and we wish everybody well. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us today. I so appreciate it. And Michelle, I know you do too, even though you've been quiet. I know. I know. And, <laughs> and I'm here for you both anytime you want. All right. Take All right, me up you. on it. Okay. We will. Well, don't you? All right. You Should did. we call you later? No. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll be waiting. All right. All okay. right. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience. Until next time. All right. Time.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Are you looking for high-end pickleball equipment, attire, or even a luxe pickleball vacation? Introducing Luxury Pickleball, the curator of all products and experiences for your social or competitive pickleballer. Paddles, attire, accessories, and quality life experiences wherever you travel with your paddle. Use discount code SHESA10. That's SHESA10 for 20% off for quality on and off the court. Let's go. Follow us on Instagram at she's a 10 times five. You can click on the link in our bio to listen to all of our previous episodes, as well as check out our live video interviews over our YouTube channel. You can also find us on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, pretty much wherever else you decide to listen to your favorite podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe.